Welcome to Tidbits Presents Ado Mobile Me. We're going to get started in a few minutes. Uh, we wanted to give people some time to uh, co you know, collect in here. And so until that point, we're going to uh, just chat for a few minutes and talk about some of the things that, uh, that Joe and I have run into with Mobile Me in the past uh, few weeks, honestly, that, that uh, you know, we, we sort of get this impression that Apple has been giving us great amount of time. They've been really patient. You know, the, the messages have been coming nonstop since October's introduction of iCloud. But at the same time, I think it's easy for those of us in the industry to get this kind of uh, mistaken impression about how much attention people really pay to Apple and to their technical infrastructure. Just this morning, I was going running with a friend of mine and uh, mentioned that I was going to be doing a presentation. He said, oh, what are you going to be talking about? And I said, you know, not a computer friend, so I said, oh, you know, Apple has this service called MobileMe, which is going away. And uh, as of the end of the month, and he said, oh, what, you know, what about that site that I set up for my girlfriend when she ran across the country two or three years ago? And I said, well, you know, it's going away as of two weeks from now. And he had heard nothing about it, you know, mm -hmm. that he's, he's not in that world. He doesn't pay attention to it. He set up the site two years ago, does not interact with it, but he wants it to be up. And so I uh, you know, said, so you can't, probably can't watch the presentation given what you're doing today, but, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll talk, to you, talk to you later on about what you need to figure out. So in any event, uh, I was still surprised, you know, two weeks out, here's someone who hasn't even heard about it. it. It's very troubling to me how many people seem not to have gotten the message. I mean, Apple has been sending out emails uh, every, you know, a couple of weeks saying, you know, only three weeks left, you know, only however long left until MobileMe goes away. Do this now, do that now. But... Uh, I'm I'm still seeing where so anytime any of them change, I get a little alert, and um, so I got this alert that this certain piece of backup software had recently been updated, and I, I went to the to the page, and the, the update was you know uh, added you know made it made a change due to the fact that mobile me is going away. So the, the, the backup software previously supported iDisk, and so now this, it's being prepared for the end of mobile me. But ironically, the site for the backup program itself is hosted on homepage.mac.com, and there was no indication anywhere on the site that that was going to change or, you know, redirect or new URL or click here or anything. Um, and, you know, there, there was a mug that I gave a presentation on iCloud to, a couple of months ago, they had the same thing, uh, their, their homepage on MobileMe, and I mentioned, you know, the, the homepage for this mug is going to go away. I hope you have a plan in place to, uh, to change that, and uh, as of today, it's, it's still there. So, um, <laughs> well, I guess that's why you're watching, right? That, that's precisely <laughs> we're, it. We're so. here to give, you, to give you a clue. Yeah, yeah. So in any event, um, uh, it seems that we're, we're getting, getting, getting started here. Uh, Joe, I see that we have, we're up to 101 viewers, wow. which, is, which is nice to see. Great. And uh, so I think we'll, I'm seeing the count climb 108. So I'm gonna, we'll, we'll just keep chatting for another few minutes while people come in. It's, it's unusual for us. We, we've never done this before, but there really is that sense that, you know, you can see people streaming into the room and looking for their seats and things like that. So... Well, it, it's nice. It's nice to have such a big crowd. Um, it's it's also nice that um, you know you're not here in in person because. Um, but I'd like um, to be in Paris. You, well, yes, but <laughs> I I couldn't fit a hundred people in my apartment, <laughs> and of course I feel obligated to to serve you cheese and wine and you know. Um, but uh, well, but it's nice nice for you virtually to be. Here. Maybe just I could come to Paris and we could do this live from your apartment next. Now time. see now that now you're talking. You know, that, I think that would work. Um, so, the uh, uh, w yeah, we'll see. It's 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 gorgeous here in Ithaca too. But uh, and until uh, until we uh, get those matter transporters working, uh, Google Hangouts and Air seems to be a, a pretty good second bet. Well, it was um, it was a rainy day in Paris, and the last half hour or so, the the sun has started to shine. Uh, so. Okay, well, we're up to 127, and it uh, looks like the, the, the uh, well, 132, I was going to say, the number of people seems to be slowing down a little bit. So 
I think we should probably get started. It's 12:05, um, right. and uh, people can come in, keep coming in, and they will just uh, pick up as we go. So let me, without further ado, switch into my introduction. So good day, everyone. Thank you for coming. I'm Adam Angst, publisher of Tidbits and the Take Control series of eBooks, and I'd like you to welcome you to our first Tidbits Presents event live on Google Hangouts on Air. Today's presentation is a do mobile me. And giving it will be Joe Kissel, who you can see in a little window on the bottom of your screen. Joe is one of the best known names in the world of Apple writers, thanks to his contributions to Tidbits, his articles for Macworld, and his numerous Take Control eBooks. More so than perhaps anyone outside Apple, Joe truly gets MobileMe, since he wrote Take Control of .Mac about MobileMe's predecessor, then Take Control of MobileMe, and now Take Control of iCloud, MobileMe's replacement. If you're watching this recorded on YouTube, nothing more to do but sit back and enjoy. However, if you're viewing this presentation live, we have a few suggestions for interacting with Hangouts on Air. First, if you hover over the player, controls appear, including a full screen button in the lower right. Click that to give us bigger heads, if we need that already, <laughs> and if you can so you can read the slides. If the text is fuzzy, you may want to step back a bit. Second, if you have to take a short break, we believe that you can click the play pause button to pause the playback and then resume it later. We'll have continued on and you'll be watching us in the past. It's just like pausing in TiVo. Third, if you want to ask questions or direct comments my way, I'll be monitoring the comment stream on this post in Google+. I don't believe you'll see comments from other people unless you refresh the page. And if you do that, I think any TiVo-like delay will be lost and you'll be catapulted into the present. Fourth, if people want to maintain a back channel of chatter, which I'll also try to monitor for questions and comments, use the TB Presents hashtag in Twitter. We'll pause a couple of times for questions about what Joe has just said, and then we'll take general questions at the end. I'll be collecting and rephrasing questions for Joe as necessary, but please try to keep them concise. Finally, a disclaimer. We're new to this, and Google, new, and Google Plus Hangouts and Air itself is quite new. If we have any technical difficulties, look at my Google Plus page for information about what's going on, and hopefully nothing will. With that said, let me borrow some words from the Bard, specifically Mark Antony. Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. I come to bury mobile me, not to praise it. And if you don't believe me about mobile me's fate, Perhaps you'll believe Star Trek's Dr. McCoy. He's dead, Joe. And once I got started, I couldn't resist uh, giving you another uh, confirmation about Mobile Me's fate. Try Monty Python's John Cleese. Now's the point if I was giving this live, I would pause and wait for everyone to, to stop smiling. But since I can't see you all, without further ado, Joe Kissel. Take it away, Joe. Thank you, Adam. And you can't, you can't see everybody because I'm, I'm finding that, that we have a really, you know, a really handsome audience. <laughs> uh, it looks like some of you aren't wearing pants, but I'm not judging. Um, so, We're not wearing pants. So. Well, <laughs> so thank you all for coming. And uh, I, you know, I, 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 we, I, we had tossed around some different names for this presentation. I, I was thinking maybe we'd call it a memorial service for Mobile Me. Um, but uh, we are, we're going to talk about the end of Mobile Me and what that means, and uh, what some of the some of the things that that may be uh, available to replace all our parts of it in the future. Now, the reason we're doing this is that we have, you know, I, I wrote these books, but in in our watching Twitter and talking to people and doing user group presentations and email, uh, we have we have discovered that there's a lot of anxiety these days about the end of mobile meet. Yes, Apple's been sending out announcements, and yes, it's been covered a lot in the press, but there are a lot of people who either haven't gotten the message or don't know what the message means or don't quite know what to do now that mobile me is about to end. 
uh, or have partially made the transition but partially not, and they're in a sort of weird state. And so they're, they're anxious, they're nervous, they're worried. So today what I want to do is two things. First of all, I want to put on my most soothing voice and reassure you that everything is going to be okay. Bubble Me will end, but it's going to be all right. You just follow the steps that I explained to you, and there will be no problems. You will not lose any data. Everything will be fine. The second thing I want to do is to mention that two weeks from today is June 30th, which is the last day of Mobile Me. And if you haven't already transferred your data and found new providers, then ah, you better hurry because you're going to be caught in a swirling vortex of the digital apocalypse and it's going to be a catastrophe, <laughs> which could be kind of exciting and fun. Um, you know, like, uh, like jumping out of an airplane without a parachute. I hear those last few seconds are awesome. <laughs> so uh, bear in mind just those two things. Relax, but also take urgent action. And so today I'm going to try to help you to do both of those things. Now, I, I called this presentation Adieu Mobile Me because, you know, in French we have a couple of different ways of saying goodbye. Ordinarily, uh, if I'm just leaving someone that I plan to see the next day, I would say au revoir, which is basically see you later. But uh, there's this other term which, which you really hardly ever hear. You hear it if you watch the sound of music, or if you go to a funeral, but, but hardly ever other than that. This, this word adieu, which literally means to God, as though I'm, I'm you know, you're, you're going to heaven now, I'm giving you into God's hands, uh, you know, I'm not going to see you again. Uh, now that's what we're saying to Mobile Me, and I, you know, I was trying to figure out what would the afterlife look like for a cloud-based service. I, I really don't know. Um, maybe it doesn't have far to go, or, because, you know, during, during, Mobile, Mobile, during Mobile Me's lifetime, there was certainly enough uh, weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth, so it might be going the other direction, I don't know. <laughs> but in any case, we are saying a final, final goodbye to Mobile Me, uh, but we're not saying goodbye to your data, and we're not saying goodbye necessarily to any capabilities. So we're going to figure this out together. Now, um, I would like to uh, switch over to slides here, if we can do that. Alrighty. Um, give you a little table of contents, what we're going to cover today. Uh, just so you have an idea of, you know, when you can fall asleep or go to the bathroom or uh, ignore me. Uh, so the first thing we're going to do is talk about what things that were in MobileMe are still going to be around in iCloud, at least in some form, and what parts are really and truly going to be gone forever as of two weeks from now. Uh, then we're going to talk about what we know is going to happen on June 30th, and what we don't quite know yet, or what we suspect, or what we're unsure about. Uh, then, and this applies to everyone, even people who have already transitioned their mobile me accounts to iCloud. We're going to talk about getting stuff off of your iDisk, because you may have stuff there that you didn't even realize was there. It's very easy not to, not to be aware of what all is there, and this is the time to get it off. Um, then, having dealt with that, we're going to ask the question, can you migrate to iCloud? A lot of people can. A lot of people, obviously, millions have. But it's not obvious. There are some people who don't have uh, devices with the right software or have other extenuating circumstances can't migrate to iCloud. So we'll figure that out. And if you can, we will explain how you go about doing that. Now, um, one of the things that you will need in order to migrate to iCloud is this mysterious thing called an Apple ID. Some of us have one. Some of us have many. Some of us don't have any Apple ID at all. Uh, so we are going to get to the bottom of a few of the most common problems and issues with Apple IDs. Uh, then we're going to talk about what if you have some devices that are compatible with iCloud, but others that aren't. You know, you have a Mac that's running Line, and that's great. It works with iCloud. You also have maybe an old iPhone or an old iPod Touch or something that isn't, or you have a Mac that's running Snow Leopard. What do you do? And then we're going to further talk about what happens if none of your devices are compatible with iCloud. Then are you, are you truly screwed, or is there some hope for you? Spoiler, yes, there's some hope for you. So that's what we're going to cover today. 
I want to uh, begin with the good news. So uh, there are a lot of features that if you have been using MobileMe, uh, you've gotten used to, you've liked maybe, um, that are still around in some form in iCloud. Things like mail, contacts, calendars, syncing of Safari bookmarks among your devices, find my iPhone, iPod Touch, iPad, find my Mac, and back to my Mac. So all of these features exist existed in MobileMe, they still exist in iCloud, and what's more, uh, your data can, can migrate forward from MobileMe to iCloud without a whole lot of trouble. Now, a lot of these services do have some differences in, in iCloud. They either add things or take things away or do things in a slightly different form, but fundamentally they are pretty much the same, and uh, you don't have very much to worry about with those. And I should, of course, mention that it's not just old features that are carried over to iCloud. iCloud adds tons of new things that uh, that weren't in MobileMe at all. You know, there's PhotoStream and iTunes Match, and there's a uh, whole, you know, documents in the cloud, and there's a whole bunch of new things uh, coming in Mountain Lion and uh, iCloud Backup, your I iOS devices, lots of good stuff. So uh, these are some of the good things about the transition. Now, on the other hand, there are also a number of things that are going away. So uh, let's let's run down the list. First of all, no Mac to Mac data syncing. So here's what I mean. In mobile me, it used to be that you'd go to the mobile me pane of system preferences, and there would be a whole list of things there. Yes, you know, mail contacts calendars, but also things like keychains and system preferences and mail accounts and uh, maybe uh, data from Yojimbo, from Transmit, from other third-party uh, applications. And as long as you had those checkboxes checked on two or three or all of your Macs, those pieces of data would sync between your Macs. Unfortunately, that is not part of iCloud. Some parts of this may come back in the future, but basically that, that capability is lost. The mail component of iCloud loses a few features compared to MobileMe. Now, in MobileMe, if you wanted to check your email using a POP client, you could. iCloud is strictly IMAP, and as another part of that, it used to be that the, the MobileMe website itself, the, 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 you know, without even using mail on a Mac, the website itself could check another POP account. You know, you have some other POP account, uh, and you don't want to have to log into two different places to check it. No problem. Go into, you know, me.com, look at your mail, and it's, it's right there. So that will also disappear. In MobileMe, you could set up multiple from addresses. So let's say you have two or three email accounts. I have a, a Gmail account, I have an AOL account, I have a Hotmail account. I could set up MobileMe so that when I send a message, that message appears to come from another account. And when somebody replies to it, the reply will go to the other account. That capability is not in iCloud. And finally, there's aliases. Aliases are additional email addresses that point to the same inbox. Now, MobileMe let you set up five of them iCloud lets you set up three of them. So if you had five and you transitioned to MobileMe, or from MobileMe to iCloud, that's fine. All five of those aliases will, will come through. They're grandfathered in. But if you delete one of them or two of them, you won't be able to get them back. You lose those slots. So uh, mail is, is a little bit less capable, capable in those ways. Contacts. Now, uh, this is a real sore spot for a lot of people because it used to be that address book in Mac OS X had a sort of publish and subscribe feature. So I can publish my contacts and my wife or another family member or a colleague can subscribe to them so that we're both looking at the same stuff. That capability no longer exists with iCloud. And in fact, iCloud has no way at all of sharing contacts. Let me put a little asterisk next to that. There is a kind of way that you can cheat, but no officially sanctioned way of sharing contacts, which is, uh, which is a real pity. Um, now, back to my Mac still exists, so you can take your Mac to, you know, a coffee shop or library or whatever and uh, connect to your Mac at home or at the office to do screen sharing and file sharing. That still exists. The catch is that you can only get back to a Mac that is also running uh, Lion or later and is logged into your iCloud account. If your old Mac is running Snow Leopard or earlier, that won't work. Similarly, find my iPhone and find my whatever is part of iCloud, but you cannot find a device that's still running iOS 4 and is not logged into your iOS, uh, your iCloud account. Then we get to the big thing, that is iDisk. So iDisk was this storage space in the cloud, 
You can optionally uh, you know, have a copy of all those files on your local Mac or all of your local Macs. And it was used for a lot of things. It was used for syncing files, for sharing files, for uh, photos, for uh, websites, for all kinds of different things. iDisk is going away. So uh, one of the things on your iDisk might have been gallery. You can go into iPhoto and pick a bunch of photographs and say, publish this to my mobile me gallery. And then it makes a really nice web page and you can invite other people and they can upload their own photos. And it's really great. Show your photos and videos there. Gallery is going away because the, the photos themselves lived on your iDisk and iDisk is going away. Uh, also backup. So uh, some people used Apple's backup utility or another third party backup program. I know. <laughs> not, not my favorite backup program, but um, some people would use that to uh, backup files to their iDisk and backup is going away. So we will be talking a lot about the, the various things connected with the loss of iDisk and what to do about that. So what exactly does happen on June 30th? Well, it's two weeks from today, or the day we're recording this, we're doing the, the live presentation. Uh, and it's a Saturday, which is interesting. So what, what we believe is going to happen is, first of all, data will stop syncing to the MobileMe servers. Server. So any device you have, any you know, Mac or iPhone or whatever, that currently connects to something.me.com to sync some kind of data, whether it's contacts or bookmarks or email or whatever, will simply stop syncing. Uh, secondly, um, if you go to www.me.com, you will no longer be able to log into your MobileMe account. Now, I imagine that Apple will probably redirect that to iCloud.com or they will have some other information there. I don't think the site itself will completely and immediately disappear, but the, the site will no longer be a, a way that you can access your data. Uh, if you have a website that is homepage.mac.com or web.mac.com or web.me.com, anything you've published to MobileMe with iWeb or with uh, some other tool, that's going to produce a 404 error. The, the, the files will just be gone. Uh, they won't be there anymore. Nobody will be able to access that website. And uh, any files that are stored online on your iDisk will not be accessible. Now, if you have a local copy, which you should, and I'm sure you will momentarily, uh, then you'll still have those files, but other people won't be able to get at them. So file sharing and syncing using your iDisk will simply stop. To the best of everyone's knowledge and belief, any, any data at all that is stored locally on any of your devices will stay there. Apple is not going to reach into your Mac and start deleting files that are on your hard disk. They're not going to reach into iCal or into uh, address book and, and pull data out. It's not like that data is going to immediately disappear, but it will disappear from the cloud. So if you're relying on uh, accessing that through a website or syncing data between devices through the cloud, that syncing capability is what's going to disappear. Now, there are also some things that we don't know about June 30th. And the first thing we don't know is exactly when is this transition going to occur? It could be that 12.01 a.m. Pacific time Apple throws a switch and it's just gone. That's a possibility. It could be that they wait until 11.59 p.m. It could be that, I mean, it's a Saturday, and I know if I, if I were working for Apple, I would not want to be on you know, weekend duty trying to deal with all of the things that are likely to go wrong and the massive outcry from the public on a Sunday. So it's possible that they'll just sort of not quite get around to throwing the switch until the first thing on Monday morning. I really don't know. All I'm saying is the safe thing to do is to assume that it's going to be 12.01 a.m. on June 30th and have everything done that you need to do by June 29th at the very latest. Second thing we don't know is what happens if you don't? What happens if you have a mobile me account today? You have a somebody at mac.com or me.com address and you don't migrate it to iCloud before June 30th. What will happen then? Will it be possible if you decide on July 3rd that now is the day I want to migrate my account, will Apple let you? Will Apple let you use that same uh, email address? Will your data still be there? Will you still be able to get at your email messages and, and things that are in the cloud at that point? I don't know. Apple hasn't said. I guess we'll find out in a couple of weeks. But again, the safe assumption is that you won't, so make other arrangements now. The third thing we don't know is will you have to change your email server settings? Now, as I'll talk about in a little bit, 
it's possible to uh, migrate to iCloud and now I have my Snow Leopard, or sorry, my Lion Mac, or my, uh, my new iPhone, or whatever, and I'm accessing my iCloud email account. It's possible to uh, still get at that email account on your old Macs, you know, your Snow Leopard Macs, or on anything else, just using a regular iMac client, iMap client, as long as you point it to the right address. But there's also this technique that Apple has, where if you don't have a compatible computer, you can still migrate just your email account, not the whole rest of, of MobileMe, just your email account. And as of today, if you do that migration right now, it looks as though all of your devices will continue to work just fine if you use the old existing something 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 dot me dot com address. It could be that as of June 30th, you're going to have to switch that to, you know, p dash whatever 99 dot imap dot me dot com or, or what have you, whatever the, whatever the relevant new servers are. I don't know. That's something we'll probably only find out in a support notice after uh, the transition occurs. And the last thing we don't know is whether Apple is going to have any sort of safety net. If someone has not heeded the warnings and they had some data that only existed in the cloud, and then a week later they discover, oh, it's gone, will Apple have some way of getting your data back? I don't know. Um, wouldn't be surprised, but I wouldn't count on it either. So there is a lot of uncertainty, but the best way of dealing with the uncertainty is to, is to take things into your own hands and deal with this stuff now. Now, the first thing I want to talk about is your iDisk. And the reason I want to talk about it first is that this is important not only for people who have not yet mo migrated from MobileMe to iCloud, but it's important even for people who have been using iCloud for six months because um, just because you've, you've migrated all of your other data, your email and contacts and so forth to iCloud does not do anything until your iDisk yet. You might still have files there. You might have websites still on your iDisk. And so I wanted to remind everyone who's, who's watching or listening, uh, you need to look at your iDisk right now, deal with all the stuff that's on there. And uh, if you, if that, you know, if you've done everything else except for that, then once we've gotten past the iDisk portion of this presentation, then you can uh, go off and do something else. And you won't need to watch, watch the rest of this. So as a reminder, everything must go. Either you will remove it or Apple will. And whatever else you do, I mean, I'll talk about finding new homes for these various kinds of data, but whatever else you do, back it up. And there are a zillion ways to back it up. Uh, I can <clears throat> refer you to a few books or articles that I've written on that subject. Uh, I don't care how you do it, just make sure that everything that is on your iDisk you have an extra copy of or preferably a couple of copies somewhere else. Now, in case you have forgotten or aren't aren't sure, how do you get at your iDisk? Well, one way to do it is go into the Finder, go up to the Go menu, go down to iDisk, and choose My iDisk. Uh, now, I should, I should mention that this menu command will only appear if you are logged in to your MobileMe account in the MobileMe pane of System Preferences on your Mac. So if you, have, if you have never logged in, or if you logged out, then first do that, then you'll see this. And when you do that, you'll get a little window in the Finder that has the contents of your iDisk. Now, basically, uh, what I want you to do is to go through all the folders there and see if there's anything in there that Apple didn't put there, any of your own personal files, and just drag them someplace else. Now, um, frustratingly, some of these folders were created by Apple, and they contain files that are absolutely useless to you. For example, the library folder. There is nothing inside the library folder that you can possibly use, nothing inside the data folder that you can use. But there might be, there might very well be something inside the documents folder, the pictures folder, and very crucially, the sites folder and the web folder. Uh, those contain uh, websites that, that might have been created in either of a couple different ways. And if so, you want to make sure you've grabbed everything that's in there and made a copy of it, put it someplace else. Uh, now, uh, you might also have mu music, you might ha also have movies. Uh, those are not as commonly used. Uh, I'm, I'm merely highlighting the, the folders that I think are the most, uh, most important to look at for most people. Now, there is another thing you can do if you go into the Mobile Me pane of System Preferences and click on the iDisk button up there, you will see in the lower left corner this, uh, this iDisk Sync thing. So what iDisk Sync does is it, is it mirrors everything that is on your iDisk in the cloud 
onto a disk image, and it, this appears as a disk on your desktop. Now, um, if you have done this already, which is to say um, you don't see a start button there, you see a stop button, and it says iDisk Sync On, then what's neat about this is you already have a local copy of all that stuff. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't also make a manual backup. You really should, because an extra backup never hurts. But all you have to do is click the stop button. And when you click the stop button, it will stop syncing that local stuff to the cloud, but it will, it will move this disk image from its little hiding place deep in your library folder up onto your desktop. And then you'll just have, you'll have a reference. You'll have an archive there. This disk image of everything that used to be on your iDisk when you were uh, automatically syncing it to the cloud. And if you haven't done that, go ahead and click Start. Let it sync. It might take a little while. It might take a long while. When it's done syncing, stop it, and then you'll get the disk image. So this is just an extra easy way to get a copy of all that stuff on your iDisk. But again, I, I don't recommend relying solely on this. Um, now, uh, so the iDisk is, getting the data off your iDisk is one thing, but then what do you do with it? I mean, if you have files that you were sharing, you still want to share those files, right? If you had photos that you were sharing, you still want to share the photos. If you had a website you were hosting there, you still want to host the website somewhere and so on. So, so what do you do? Well, in a sense, this is really easy, and in a sense, it's really hard. I can recommend various services that you can look into that do similar kinds of things to certain aspects of, of iDisk hosting. Um, what I can't give you is an exact one-for-one -one replacement because all the services do things a little bit differently, and none of them is an exact or perfect replacement. They, the, you know, you're going to have to look into what is their pricing, what are their terms of service, uh, how much storage space do they give me? What, what am I allowed to do? What am I not allowed to do? Um, and I, and I, I have some information about this in my, uh, my book on iCloud, but really because everyone's needs are so different, all I can tell you is here are some to look at. Um, and once you've found one, um, usually it's as simple as using your favorite FTP client, such as Fetch or Transmit, to, uh, you know, Enter, enter the information for the new site that your, your provider will give you and upload it, usually. So let's talk first about the, the parts of iDisk that, that are file related. So file storage, file syncing, file sharing. Uh, let me just cut straight to the chase and say use Dropbox. Just really, just use Dropbox. Now, I know there are a lot of other services out there that are good and that do things very similar to Dropbox. I use some of them too, but all of us in the tidbits and take control world rely very, very heavily on Dropbox. I was using Dropbox way, way, way before, uh, you know, MobileMe got its, uh, you know, pink slip. Uh, we, I, I always found Dropbox to work way, way better than iDisk. In fact, there, there is rather, uh, Believable rumor that Apple tried to buy Dropbox, be presumably because they just couldn't get iDisk to work and they wanted to get something that did. Um, Dropbox is great. It lets you sync stuff between your computers. You can access your Dropbox on your iPad, your iPhone, your uh, Android phone, your almost any kind of computer. Uh, you can share files with other people. They can, uh, you know, you, we, we use it for collaborative uh, editing and writing. Um, and you get two gigabytes of data storage for free, and if you need more than that, you can pay for it. It's fast, it's reliable, um, and lots and lots of apps, both on the Mac and on iOS and, and other platforms too, automatically uh, tie into your Dropbox uh, for their cloud storage. So if, you, if I had to just pick one place to, to, to recommend for all sorts of cloud storage, it would be Dropbox. It's a really great service. Go sign up now. now Dropbox. Not the only place you can go. Um, you can also, I'll just give you a few examples. There's a place called uh, MacMate, and notice that's MacMate.me, not MacMate.com or org or anything else. Uh, MacMate offers uh, web hosting and uh, file hosting, it's so it, it has portions of what, uh, what MobileMe offered, and it's very Mac-friendly. Uh, there's Spider Oak, there's Sugar Sync. I've used both of these. I, I like them. Um, they are different from each other. They are different from Dropbox. They are different from iDisk. 
But these are all ways that you can uh, have some set of files on your Mac that are automatically synced to the cloud and to other devices and, uh, and also shared with other people. Also, I just learned today, uh, so, so Dolly Drive, which is a, a way of, of sending your time machine backups into the cloud, they have a, an aspect of their service called Dolly Space, which is very much like an iDisk. And apparently, just like a week ago, they added uh, sharing to, uh, to, to Dolly Space. So you can get a similar uh, capability there. Um, so these are just a few. And there, there are others. But um, I will just tell you that the one I rely on is Dropbox, and uh, I, I highly recommend it. Um, now, uh, what about the web hosting aspect of iDisk? So it is possible in a roundabout way to host a web page from Dropbox, but it's really not ideal. It's not really optimized to be a web host. Um, if you go to this URL, macworld.com slash article slash these numbers, which uh, Adam has somewhere posted a link to, um, if you go there, you'll read an article I wrote about finding a Mac-friendly web host. And, and what I basically say in this article is, you know, Mac-friendly is a bit of a misnomer. It's like finding a food-friendly restaurant. I mean, kind of a web host is a web host. They, they all do basically the same thing. They're going to charge you different amounts of money for different amounts of storage and bandwidth and what have you. But HTML files and, and .pngs and CSS files, I mean, they're, they're just standard. So you can, you can put them on any web host, and they're going to work. Now, there are some providers that are more clueful when it comes to Macs, especially when it comes to tech support. Um, and you might feel more comfortable using one of those. So I talk about that. And in this article, I also talk about if you have created your site in iWeb and it's currently published to MobileMe, what do you need to change in there so that instead of going to MobileMe, that you take that very same site and now you transport it to uh, a completely different web host uh, using FTP. It's not hard, um, and the directions are in that article. Now, I. I I wasn't going to mention this, but I just have to. I just have to say, iWeb isn't going away. iWeb will still work tomorrow. It will still work on July 1st. It will still work a year from now. I don't think Apple will ever update it again. And um, and so it doesn't really have much of a future. And it's probably not a good long-term solution to create websites. There are lots of other tools out there that are great at creating websites. There's Sandbox, there's Rapid Weaver, there's Coda, depending on you know, your level of geekiness and expertise and so on. Um, you may want to look into uh, a different tool, but this isn't urgent. You can do this next month. You can do it in a few months. Uh, you can certainly convert uh, a website to, to be edited in another uh, application after you have transferred it to a new host. Um, so just a few, and again, there are thousands of web hosts, and I have a, f I have, you know, a number of them listed in my book. Uh, a few that uh, I have some experience with and can recommend are one and one. Uh, you know, you can see that one of their, one of their plans is uh, three forty nine a month. So that's really not bad at all for web hosting. Um, there is DreamHost. Uh, they're charging looks like eight ninety five a month for unlimited storage, unlimited bandwidth, and many, many more features. Um, MacMate, the same uh, service I mentioned uh, a minute ago, they offer uh, you know uh, something like an iDisk and also web hosting. And, and as I say, there are there are a zillion others. Find one that you like. Find one that you are comfortable with, with their pricing, with their features, with their business practices, and just go for it. Um, next category is gallery. So I mentioned you can go to iPhoto and upload some photos to this wonderful gallery. That's going away. And unfortunately, there aren't any other services I know of that have all the same features of gallery. But if what you're basically looking for is a way to share some photos with your family and friends, there are, again, a million choices. Now, one of them is uh, actually Dropbox. And this isn't the, the best known usage of Dropbox, but it, it, it works just fine. You can actually uh, put stuff in a, in a special folder on your Dropbox and create a, a web page of photos, uh, very, very similar to a gallery out of it. Uh, you might have heard of Flickr, and there's this little company called Facebook, which uh, they were in the news for something recently. I can't remember what. Um, and uh, Picasso Web Albums, Zang Zing, again, just just a few examples out of the many. The reason I chose these particular examples is that they have good Mac support. Um, most of them uh, tie in fairly easily into iPhoto. 
Um, maybe not as easily as MobileMe did, but it's, it's pretty easy to get stuff from iPhoto or Aperture into these sites. Um, so again, I can't really, you know, I, I, don't, I basically don't do photo sharing myself. <laughs> so I can't, I can't make a very strong recommendation about this. I can just say, here, if you're looking for a replacement, here is a starting point. And again, um, Adam's uh, list has URLs for all of these places. Um, there is another option. If you have an iPhone, iPod Touch, or iPad, you can get a copy of iPhoto for iOS from Apple. It is $10. And iPhoto for iOS has a feature that the Mac version doesn't have, or at least doesn't have yet, and that's something called journals. So it's very much like creating an album. You select a bunch of pictures, and you can arrange them any way you want, resize them, uh, put titles, put captions. Uh, I, I, I put this little thing together in about you know, two minutes on my iPhone, just, just as an example. I, I pressed a button, tapped a button, and hey, it gave me a web page. And, uh, and this web page looks very much like uh, Mobile Me Gallery. Now, it doesn't have the feature where I can invite my friends to upload their own photos to it. Um, but for, for basic photo sharing, um, this could be just fine. So it's called Journals. It's a feature in uh, iPhoto for iOS, and that's uh, potentially another option. I wouldn't be surprised if this feature migrates into the Mac version of iPhoto at some point, but I don't know. Now, um, I, I want to just take a breather here, take a sip of water, and ask Adam if any important questions have accumulated to this point that we ought to uh, talk about before we move on. Well, thanks, Joe. The, there are a couple of comments and questions. Oh, let me uh, unlock here. There's a couple of comments and questions. Um, Philip Sandiford notes on Google Plus that iDisk could sneak through my employer's firewall, and I've not found another cloud drive service that can. And he says that, that that let him send videos to clients that were too sensitive for YouTube vi viewing. Um, have you run into anything that you may have heard of that, that's kind of firewall sensitive that way? Um, I haven't. Um, I, I, I was actually not aware that I just could do that. So, hey, I've learned something about MobileMe today. Um, I mean, I just used WebDAV. WebDAV uses port 80, just like a web browser. Um, so my, my guess would be, and this is only a guess, that uh, any, any other service that relies on WebDAV and port 80 would probably be able to do that. But it's not something I have personally had to do. Um, and so I'm afraid I don't have good advice on that, but, um, but thank you for asking, and uh, I'm going to make a note to myself with a pen on paper. Uh, no iPad? Well, it's, 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 it's over there. <laughs> <laughs> I have to reach too far. Um, and uh, and I, will, I will look into that, but I don't know offhand. Okay. Um, second question, uh, Bruce McCallum asks, why did you drop GoDaddy on your list of recommended alternatives to iWeb hosting for MobileMe? Um, you may have heard of some recent practices at GoDaddy that were ethically questionable, um, ranging from, you know, the president of the company boasting about how he's hunting elephants to... Um, well, <coughs> Google it. Um, <laughs> there, there was a whole campaign a couple of months ago of people saying, okay, you know, GoDaddy has just done too many things that I feel uncomfortable with uh, giving them my business. Um, and there was even, <coughs> I, I can't confirm that this was true, but I can confirm that a lot of people claimed it was true, that when they, they found out GoDaddy was doing things they didn't like, and started trying to transfer their domain names away, it appeared as though GoDaddy was putting up all sorts of blocks and delays to prevent that from happening. Um, so I, I got to the point where I personally was not comfortable giving GoDaddy my business, and I moved the stuff that I had there elsewhere, and a lot of other people did too. Now, I mean, they, they offer okay services and okay prices if, you're not, if you don't have an issue with their business practices, or if you are just a huge Danica Patrick fan, then, hey, you know, go daddy. But um, personally, uh, I decided that I would rather not. 
So I will I also note that uh, Glenn Fleischman, who writes uh, Take Control of Domain Names for us, and we've been looking at, at, at that book recently, he had said that one of the things that he was going to do was be removing GoDaddy from that. And I think there was partly some of the business practices, again, just making him a little bit uncomfortable. And, and also, I think there had been some technical issues where people had felt that they had problems, support was lacking, and GoDaddy just didn't seem to care. So again, grain of salt, but if you're interested in GoDaddy, you might want to do your research about what people have been saying online. Um, last question uh, before we head back into the slides. Um, Chris Heilman, or Craig Heilman, sorry, um, on Google Plus asks, Zenfolio versus SmugMug for integration with Aperture. Have you uh, any, any experience with Zenfolio and SmugMug? <coughs> I, I have experience with SmugMug. I do not have experience with Zenfolio. So all I can tell you is that uh, in, in my testing, I liked SmugMug quite a bit. Um, I, I think I still have, pretty sure I still have a paid account. I, you know, I, <laughs> I, I, I get accounts for things because I'm writing about them and then I kind of forget about them and then I get these renewal notices and like, well, should I pay them another $50? I don't remember. But um, uh, like I say, I don't really, I don't do photo sharing myself. So um, I, you know, I, I get an account, I test it, and then I move on. So um, no, no opinion about Zenfolio because I haven't used it. And just finally, Cheryl Smead notes really quickly, uh, I use Pearlight.com for $99 a year. You can host up to 10 websites. The regular prices are very reasonable, and she's experienced no downtime. So yeah. recommendation for Pearlight.com from a viewer. So Great. Joe, why don't we head back into the slides? Right on. All right, um, so <clears throat> let, us, let us stipulate that we have said goodbye, adieu to MobileMe, and now, hey, let's say bonjour iCloud, um, maybe. Uh, so I have, to be, I have to be realistic here. Uh, I like iCloud in most respects. I like it better than MobileMe, um, but it isn't a complete or perfect replacement for MobileMe, and it isn't complete or perfect just sort of period. So uh, we have to figure out, um, can you use iCloud? And even if you can, can you use it for all the things you need? So can you use iCloud? Um, if you have a Mac, that Mac has to be running Lion, that is Mac OS 10, 10.7.2 or higher. It will still work, of course, on Mountain Lion, which is coming out next month but iCloud is not supported on Snow Leopard and it is not supported on 10.7.0 or 10.7.1. If you have a PC, it will work just fine on Windows 7 or Windows Vista. It will not work on Windows XP. Really, nobody in the world should be using Windows XP ever again for any reason, but just saying. Um, if you have an iPad, iPod Touch, or iPhone, as long as it is running iOS 5 or later, you can use iCloud. If it is still running iOS 4 or earlier, which would mean basically a, a pretty old iOS device, then unfortunately it cannot use iCloud. If you have a new Apple TV, the black ones, either the 720p or the 1080p, uh, these are the newer ones without the hard drives, uh, second or third generation, and if you've updated its software to the latest version or a reasonably late, late version, uh, that can also use a couple of features of, of iCloud, such as PhotoStream. Um, now, in addition to the right hardware, so one or more of the above, you will need this thing called an Apple ID, which we will <clears throat> talk about. Um, now, if it turns out that all of your devices, which may be one or two or ten, uh, if, they're all, if they all meet those specifications, they're running the right kind of software, there are no impediments in your way. Go for it right now, this afternoon. Migrate to iCloud if you haven't already. You must, you should, it'll be great. If some of your devices are incompatible, then I'm going to recommend go ahead and migrate the ones you can because you really do need to have iCloud in the future for a variety of things that are coming. And we will deal with those that are left. Um, if all of your devices are incompatible, there is a way that I mentioned and will describe again later on that you can move just your somebody at me.com or somebody at mac.com email account over to iCloud. It's not a lot, but it's more than nothing. 
And that, for many people, is their main use, or in some cases, their only use of MobileMe. So at least do that, and you can continue using your email on all of your devices. And then later on, uh, when you do have one or more devices that are compatible with iCloud, then you can go ahead and migrate the rest of your data. Alrighty, so let us say that you are a person who is ready to migrate from MobileMe to iCloud, either for all of your devices or for some of them. What do you do? Well, first up is backup. Um, I, I sort you know, this is, this is my mantra, backup, backup, backup. I have written a lot about backups. And, you know, I, I wrote a book about crash plan. I've written about time machine. I've written about, you know, all kinds of different ways of backing up your Mac. I don't care how you do it. I mean, I care, but I don't care. Uh, <laughs> do it however you want. Use whatever software, whatever destination you are happy about. But back up all of the data that is connected to MobileMe. In the vast majority of cases, there will be no problem. Everything will go smoothly. It'll transfer to iCloud just fine, but you can never be too careful. You are moving a whole bunch of stuff from, from one set of servers to another. It never hurts to have backups. Now, I'm saying not only should you back up, you should also export. Now, this might seem weird to some people, like, well, I have, I have a time machine backup or a super duper clone or whatever of my entire Mac. Why, you know, I, all of my data is, is part of that. Why should I then go to the additional bother of also exporting data from address book, from Safari, from iCal? Well, th the reason is that when it comes time to uh, restore this data or if you need to do troubleshooting, um, you may find it very difficult to restore just the particular pieces that are, that are wrong if all you've done is back up your entire disk. If you, uh, for example, export your, your address book contacts and then something goes wrong with just your contacts, it is super, super easy to just re-import those and in, in like a minute you're done. It's much less hassle than trying to restore that stuff either you know, in, in, in total or in part from a backup. So it's really simple. You go into address book, file, export, address book archive, it makes a file, put it on your desktop or wherever, you're done. Move on to iCal, file, export, iCal archive. That makes a, a, a file that contains copies of all the events in all of your calendars. Put it someplace. In Safari, go to file, export bookmarks, it makes a file with all of your bookmarks. And again, in each of these cases, you're ending up, ending up with one file, and the great thing about that file is that if anything goes kerflui with, with syncing of your data, and I have had a couple of times when, for example, my, uh, my iCloud bookmarks didn't quite sync exactly correct, and I'm not the only person. Uh, <laughs> Dan Frakes, if you're listening, you've had a few experiences of this. Um, so uh, if, if that happens to you, believe me, uh, you will, you'll be very, very glad that you exported because that makes it much easier to get things back. Once you've done that, you open the iCloud preference pane and just follow, you know, follow the prompts. It's going to say, okay, now enter your username and password. You do that and it's going to say, okay, now I'm going to do this. Click next. Now, I'm also, it's like the series of, of statements it's going to make about now, are you sure that you understand that this is going to happen? Click next. Okay. Now also, this is going to happen. Are you ready for this? You click next. Are, now, have you double checked that all of your devices meet these specifications? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Click next. But it's going to walk you through everything. Um, you just keep clicking through until you get to the point where it says, okay, now we're doing the upgrade. Hold still. It might take a little bit of time to upgrade all your calendars and stuff. Um, and then when you're done, you're going to end up here in the iCloud preference pane. Now, um, initially, not all of these uh, boxes will be checked. Uh, I'd say go ahead and check them all. I mean, if you sp have some specific reason that you really don't want to sync one of these kinds of data, okay, no, no problem, just turn it off. But most people will probably want to just have them all turned on. When you turn one of these on, it might take a little bit of time for that particular part of data to sync. Um, and things can go wrong, you know, if you don't have iPhoto or Aperture, you won't get PhotoStream, that won't be an option for you. If you have some weird router configuration or a double NAT or whatever, you might have an error message by back to my Mac or find my Mac. Um, but uh, in general, you turn them on and they work. On your iOS device, it's very, very similar. 
uh, you go to, you tap settings, and then you tap iCloud, and it's going to ask for your username and password. And for the same username and password, and then, oh look, you get a whole bunch of switches that look mysteriously like those switches in Mac OS X. Turn them all on, or as many as you want. Now, if you have a Mac and an iOS device, or multiple ones that you want to, you want to convert, remember to do it on your Mac first because there are parts of this migration process that can only happen on a desktop computer, a Mac or a PC. There are parts of the, of the conversion process that you can't initiate from an iOS device. So Mac first, then your iOS devices, and then just repeat this for, for all of your devices. Now, for most people, that's kind of it. That's all you want or need to configure, but I do want to mention a couple of other things that you can optionally change that you might want to. Uh, one is whether various kinds of data that iCloud can sync should sync only over a Wi-Fi connection or if it also syncs over cellular, you know, uh, Edge, 3G, uh, GPRS, whatever. Um, most carriers uh, have bandwidth caps and uh, after you reach a certain amount of data transferred per month, they will either shut you down or charge you a lot of money or throttle your speed or do something that you don't want. So you might not want to have things like photos and apps and uh, music and what have you downloading uh, while you are away from a Wi-Fi network. If that is the case, go into settings, go into store, and that little switch there, use cellular data, switch that off, and that will take care of the music, apps, and books. Then you go back into settings and go back into iCloud, and under documents and data, there's another switch that says use cellular, and turn that off so that you don't get the document syncing. Finally, um, by default, uh, all of your data from your iOS device can be backed up to the cloud, um, but if for some reason you don't want some of it to be backed up, you can configure that here. So you know, go to settings and manage storage. Um, there are, you can see these, these screens here, there are a couple different spots where you can say, well, I don't want my camera roll to be backed up, or I don't want my dev and think data to be backed up, or some particular other app's data, you can just switch them off here. Um, and you can also see, you know, this, this particular app has this much data backed up, and if you, if you want to delete that from your backup, you can tap that and tap delete, and it'll be gone. So that is the next sort of uh, uh, segment of our, of our presentation about setting up iCloud. And again, I want to just pause, get a drink of water, and see if there are any more questions uh, from that portion. Sorry. Sorry about that, just uh, <laughs> unmuting myself. Doesn't look like we have any more questions coming up. Um, so I think if you are ready, Joe, we should uh, just, just continue in pace. Thank you. All right, now for some real excitement, <coughs> your Apple ID. Okay, um, if you have ever purchased anything from Apple uh, online, you know, from iTunes, from the Mac App Store, from the uh, iOS uh, App Store, if you've ever made a, uh, an appointment at a Genius Bar, if you've ever had a, an Apple developer account, if you've ever had a, you know, iTools.Mac, MobileMe, iCloud account, if you've ever done almost anything with Apple, you have an Apple ID. It's simply a username and password, and your username, in most cases, is an email address. It might be your Mac.com or Me.com address, or it might be some other email address, basically an email address and a password. Apple wants your Apple ID to be a set of universal credentials that you can use everywhere for, for getting all kinds of Apple services. Um, th the thing is, though, and, and this is sort of, you know, sort of a general problem with, with Apple's ecosystem right now, is that the Apple ID is designed to be personal. It is something for you as a person to use. So, for example, if you have a bunch of iOS devices and Macs and you know, other Apple stuff, and you have them all logged in under your same ID, then your data will sync among those devices. And, and it's really great for that. Um, you can store your credit card with Apple if you want, so you can make one-click purchases. But there are a lot of people out there that have shared their Apple ID with other people. They say, oh, well, you know, my wife and I both want to make purchases from the Apple Store. We only want to enter our credit card information once, so we'll just share an ID, or we'll share an ID among our family, or, you know, we want to have the same contacts and calendars, so we'll share an ID. You can, but you really shouldn't, because it will break a lot of things and it will cause you all kinds of pain. 
I wish Apple had better ways of sharing things between people right now. They only have good ways of sharing stuff uh, for one person between multiple devices. But just saying, if you don't have your own personal Apple ID, you should get one. I'll tell you how to do that in a minute. And uh, you should think of it as something you use just for yourself as a human being, not for a company, not for a family. Now, if you already have a somebody at Mac.com or somebody at me.com address, that's a mobile, that's an Apple ID. That, that counts. That, that works. Um, there is a catch, though, and the reason for that asterisk is that if you had a somebody at Mac.com address, and during the time that Apple was charging for mobile me, you let your paid subscription lapse, then you may or may not be able to use that Mac.com address again in the future. Apple may have given it away to someone else. So in principle, it should work, but in some cases, it might not. Uh, but in general, if you joined MobileMe during, you know, when it was MobileMe, if that's when you first signed up for it, or if you kept a paid subscription all throughout, then either Mac.com or Me.com addresses should work just fine. Now, um, let's say that you have a completely different email address that you have used as an Apple ID, you know, asaptidbits.com or, or what have you. That, that's fine. That works. Um, but uh, when you sign up for iCloud, uh, when, you, when you use that, when you say, this is an Apple ID I want to attach to an iCloud account, Apple is going to say, well, yes, you know, one of the things you get with your, I, with your iCloud account is an email address, somebody at me.com, and we can't, we can't give you the address asatidbets.com at me.com. You know, that doesn't work. So they're going, when you do that, if you sign up for iCloud with an address that isn't somebody at me.com or somebody at mac.com, the first thing that's going to happen is Apple is going to say, now pick a username. Now, if you, if you're, you know, your email address is johnsmith at gmail.com and you say, well, I'd really like to have johnsmith at me.com, Apple's probably going to tell you, hmm, sorry, that's already been taken, so you may have to have another address. Now, the johnsmith at gmail.com will still work to get you in. It'll still be your Apple ID, but I'm just saying you're going to have to have another address on top of that that is associated with that Apple ID that is your me.com address. Now, um, how do you deal with your Apple IDs? How do you create one if you don't have one? How do you change the email address? How do you change your password? How do you figure out if you have an Apple ID or how many Apple IDs you have? You go here to appleid.apple.com and you'll see a site that looks like this. If you are one of the four people on planet Earth that has never engaged in any transaction with Apple, then you can click the big friendly blue create an Apple ID button and you can make one in about 30 seconds. Um, if you already have an account and you just want to change your password or change your username, whatever, click Manage Your Account or Reset Your Password. Now, if you think you might have set up an Apple ID a long time ago, or maybe you have three or four and you just can't remember, you're not sure, click the little Find Out link at the bottom there, and then Apple will ask you for your name, and it'll ask you for all the different email addresses you can remember ever having, and it'll do a look up in its database, and it'll try to find any uh, any Apple IDs that might be you, and it'll walk you through a process of, of validating that, yes, this is, this is really me. Now, <clears throat> there are some issues with, with Apple IDs. I do not have time to talk about all of them. I'm going to talk about a few of them. The first one that upsets a lot of people is that Apple IDs cannot be merged. So if you made some purchases from the Apple Store on one Apple ID at one point in time, and then later you made some purchases from the other, uh, from from another Apple ID, um, then you know Apple is going to have is going to treat you as though you're two separate people. You have you know this list of purchases and this list of purchases. And you might say, well, I want them all to be on the same account. Can I just combine them? And you can't, and it's really irritating. And I'm sorry. I wish you could. Um, months ago, Tim Cook um, sent somebody an email saying, yeah, 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 we know we're working on that. And I thought that surely by now there would be a solution to this. There would be a way to merge Apple IDs. I mean. If you have a Tidbits account, you can merge different addresses on your Tidbits account. It's not that hard to do. We figured it out, but somehow Apple hasn't figured it out. So unfortunately, that's a bit of a pain point. As I said earlier, sharing is problematic, and I'm going to tell you a couple of, of exceptions, workarounds to that in just a second. Uh, it's, not, it's not great to share an Apple ID with more than one person. Now, here's one exception. Uh, you can use one Apple ID for purchases and a different ID for everything else. 
so here's the canonical example. Uh, I have my own email address, my own contacts, my own calendars, my own bookmarks. These are things that I, all, I want them all to be personal to me as an individual. Um, sorry, did we, did we, something, something strange happened there, did we? Oh, I know what happened. We just lost slides, Joe. Uh, and I know, and I, I know why, too, because I wasn't looking at that computer, and, uh, whoops, and uh, Google Hangouts probably said, are, are you, do, you, do you still want to be part of this? And I wasn't looking at it to uh, say, yes, I, I want to be part of that. So let me rejoin. Well, while Joe's doing that, um, we actually have another couple of questions that I think I can, can, both, can both ask and, and start to answer while, you, while you're doing it, you can kick in. Mindy Nash asks, I'll be upgrading to Lion and moving mobile, to MobileMe to, um, and iCloud. Should this be done in any particular order? And the answer is yes, it should be done in an order because you really need to be running Lion effectively to be able to migrate to MobileMe. So you want to be doing the MobileMe transition, the, the Lion transition first, and then MobileMe. Sorry, and sorry. Um, so yeah, so it, whenever you're you're contemplating, and, and I understand this, it's one of those kind of ball of wax problems where you've got all this stuff and you've been kind of adding it up, and you know, I got to do this, and I got to do this, and I got to do this, and you need to figure out what the what the right way to go about it is. Lion, then iCloud, and unfortunately, you know, you got two weeks, so you know you're going to need to be doing that fairly quickly. Yeah, there have been a lot of people asking, you know, Mountain Lion's coming out next month. Can't I just wait until Mountain Lion comes out and just do just one upgrade instead of two? But you know, I, I can't guarantee you that you won't lose, lose your data in the meantime, or at least you know lose the online copy of it. So um, unfortunately, I, I would say, yeah, do, do what Adam said. OK, let's go back to the slides. All right, sorry for that little interruption. We, as, as Adam said, this is a learning experience for us, <laughs> figuring this out. All right. So, um, so as I was saying, the, the canonical example is, you know, uh, each person in your family has their own Apple ID that they want for their own personal information. But in addition to that, um, you want to have one Apple ID that everyone in the family uses for their purchases. So the purchases show up, you know, the same, the same music, the same TV shows, the same apps and books show up on everybody's devices. It's a very common uh, situation, and, and you can do that. All you have to do is enter the two different uh, Apple IDs in two different places. Now you can do this on any device. I'm just I'm showing you an iPhone here as an example, I guess, up here. Um, so on the left, you see the iCloud settings. So tap Settings, tap iCloud, and there I'm signed in with one account. Uh, if you then go back up to Settings and tap Store, you'll notice down there at the bottom, I'm signed in with the same account, but if I wanted to be signed in, in a with a different account, I can tap that, I can sign out, and I can sign in with a different account. So you can have two different accounts on your iPhone or on any of your devices active at the same time. Uh, one of them will be used for just the store, that is music apps, books, TV shows, and movies, um, and the other will be used for everything else. So that is, that is one problem that you can solve. Now, back to this situation of, yeah, but I didn't purchase stuff with just one Apple ID. I purchased stuff with more than one Apple ID. Um, this is not the end of the world. It's just a slight complication. So basically, it works like this. You sign into the store under one of those IDs. You download whatever you need to download. You know, you go into, go into the, the, you know, iTunes, what, you know, Whatever, whatever the content is that you need to download, whether it's uh, an app that you've purchased from uh, the App Store or music, you go ahead and download that. It might be re-downloading an old purchase or whatever. Uh, you go ahead and down that, download that, sign out. Now, go back to the store settings, sign back in again with the other ID, lather, rinse, and repeat. So what happens is when you download stuff and then you sign out of an account and you sign in under a different account, your iPhone or Mac or whatever device doesn't delete all those things you've downloaded just because they were attached to another account. It leaves them there. It's just that it will only offer you, you know, automatic updates and, and push delivery of things on, on the account that you're currently logged in under. So it's not great. It's not a perfect or ideal solution, but it is a way to get at files and, and, and apps and things that you purchased under another account um, without 
having to you know repurchase them and and you can still get get at them on any device. Um, there is another situation that I want to mention, which is that you can use multiple uh, iCloud devices on a uh, sorry multiple iCloud IDs on a single device. So um, here's an example. Uh, let's say I have a personal iCloud account. And I also have an iCloud account for my business, club, organization, family, whatever. Um, and I, I really need to access both of those accounts from my Mac or my iPhone or whatever. That's no problem. Well, it's only a little bit of a problem. So what you do is you go ahead and set up the first one. And the first one you set up is what Apple is going to call your primary account. And primary simply means one you set up first. Um, the, the primary account is going to give you um, things like documents in the cloud, find my device, back to my Mac, and bookmarks. Because those things are system-wide. These things can only fundamentally sync to one account per device. But everything else, such as contacts, notes, calendars, reminders, um, you can have more than one. Just like you can set up multiple email accounts on your device, multiple calendar accounts, same thing. You can set up multiple iCloud accounts and get access to all those things. There are just the, those two catches. The, the, the accounts that you set up after the first one are referred to as secondary accounts, which simply means that they won't have access to a few kinds of data, namely, you know, doc, documents in the cloud, find my noun, and so on. And uh, with those secondary accounts, you don't get push email. You only get push delivery of your email to your primary account. The other ones you're going to have to check on a schedule or manually. Um, so you can set up two or three uh, iCloud accounts on your Mac, on your PC, on your uh, iOS device. Um, that, is, that is certainly possible. Once you've set up your first uh, account, you just go into settings, mail contacts calendars, tap the iCloud uh, icon at the top, enter the new information, and away you go. Uh, so I see uh, Adam uh, furrowing his brows, looking at the screen as though some other questions had appeared. Are there any? Yes, indeed there are. Okay, yes, indeed there are, Joe. Um, and uh, just I'm, I'm sort of managing four different windows, so if, uh, if I look, at, look off in a distracted fashion, sometimes that's why. Um, let's see. Uh, Steve at OMUG notes, and this is just a, a, a tip, uh, veteran, read older MobileMe members, be aware that when you press tab after entering your MobileMe account name in your browser to log into MobileMe, it will automatically fill in the suffix me.com, and he's noted that sometimes they've had to manually correct it to mac.com. <laughs> so although Apple likes to say that me.com and mac.com are identical, there are definitely some situations where they are not, and if you run into a place where something doesn't seem to be working, you might want to verify that you're using a particular one. Yeah, I'll mention one place where they are very much not identical, and that is iChat, or <coughs> messages. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, AIM treats uh, Mac.com and Me.com accounts as completely independent. So um, even though Apple considers them, as you say, mostly interchangeable, um, there, there are places where, where they aren't. Okay. Um, I guess as long as you, since you mentioned um, I think this is a good time to ask as any is. Uh, um, Dan O'Donnell asks on Twitter, will iChat go away with the demise of mobile me? Um, <clears throat> so, no. Um, okay, so iChat will go away with the introduction of Mountain Lion, which is to say that Mountain Lion includes this thing called messages, which encompasses the same capabilities of, of iChat and then adds some new ones. Now, iChat, the application, will, will still exist and will still work on older Macs. And your uh, AIM accounts, uh, which could include somebody at Mac.com or somebody at Me.com, will continue to work um, in iChat. They'll continue to work in Messages. They'll continue to work in AIM or any other client that, that connects to the AIM network. Um, Apple would very much like to move people in the direction of messages. Um, so messages on Mountain Lion is going to uh, interact, hopefully, very nicely with messages on uh, iOS devices. 
the beta <clears throat> didn't entirely, but uh, but we're, we're hopeful about the future. Um, but uh, but iChat itself will not go away, um, and the underlying service will not go away. One thing um, one thing that that has gone away though, um, and I can't remember um, th this. I can't remember if this is coming back in messages. I think it might be coming back in messages, but I don't recall offhand. Is encryption. So it used to be with, with your mobile me account, uh, you got automatic um, encryption of your iChats. And that went away with um, the version of iChat in Lion. Uh, encryption was no longer an option. Um, I think it might be back in messages, but I would have to double check. OK. Kevin Johnson asks, in respect to your, your comments about secondary iCloud accounts, why might someone want a secondary iCloud well, account? What real-world example can you give where this would be an advantage? Okay, well, you know, the, the example I gave is that I have, you know, I have an account that I manage for myself as a, as a person, but also a work account, or also, you know, a, a club or organization or, or, you know, what have you, some, some group. Or maybe I have, um, you know, an alter ego, and I, I really, you know, I have, I have a secret identity, and I want to keep that other person separate. Um, or um, maybe, you know, I want to have. So I'm going to get to one of these other, you know, odd workarounds. The the other example is 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 shared contacts. So um, under iCloud, uh, Apple gives you a really good way of sharing calendars with other people. But irritatingly, they don't offer you any way to share contacts with other people. So if my wife and I want to share a contact database, there is no officially sanctioned way to do that. So one way you can cheat is you set up a second, you, you, you get a new Apple ID. It doesn't matter. It's just a dummy account. You, know, you, you, you create a new Apple ID, um, sign up for iCloud with that Apple ID. You know, it's free, so why not? And the only thing you store there is the contacts that you want to share with this other person. Just the contacts. Don't use email. Don't even turn it on. On all your devices, just turn off everything except for contacts. But you set this up on all your devices as a secondary account. Now, you set it up on your devices. Hey, your wife set it, sets it up on her devices too, or your children or whoever you want have access to this. Now, everyone can see the same contacts. Everyone can edit the same contacts. Everyone can add contacts to that. Now, <clears throat> it's it's a little bit wonky, and one of the reasons it's wonky is that on an iOS device, when you go to add a new contact, um, that it's a system-wide setting of what account that contact gets put into. So if you have two accounts or five accounts set up on your, on your iPhone, um, if you want to sometimes enter new contacts in your own personal list and other times enter it in your family list, you have to go into settings and you know, switch which the primary account is. And it, it's the, the, the user interface doesn't allow you to choose in real time which account you're putting a new contact into. So there's some things like that that are kind of wonky um, at, because, you know, again, it breaks Apple's assumption that every Apple ID is for one person. But that is perhaps the, perhaps the best real world, real world example of why you might want to have both a primary account and a secondary account on the same device. OK. Eolake Stobblehaus asks, recently I updated my Apple ID email address. On my iPhone, looking at iCloud, it has the old address, and it's grayed out. I see no way of changing it. Any ideas? Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> my address, I actually played around a little bit with this. Uh, I'm trying to remember quite why or when, but I remember thinking that in iOS, you don't, um, you can't change stuff related to I iCloud in iOS very well. You basically just have to delete the account and recreate it. Yeah, yeah. And my guess uh, for you, like, assuming that, that everything is working, is it's basically a cosmetic problem, that it, it gets that address at one point in time, it locks it into its little display, and because it knows you can't change it, Apple never put any, any sense of, of looking for a new one in there, even though it can be changed out on the web. And so that's, that's my guess with that scenario. Uh, but, yeah. you know, is it, if it's working, I wouldn't stress about it uh, too much. If it's not working, then you can delete the iTunes or the iCloud account and the iOS device and recreate it. Well, you know, I'd, I'd say to call up Apple's highly responsive technical support, but... <clears throat> yeah. 
Okay, um, Deborah Loth asks, um, my main iTunes Apple ID is something or other at Mac.com. When moving to iCloud, I failed to notice the automatic at me.com that Steve was mentioning earlier. Will this difference between my primary iCloud ID and my iTunes ID cause a problem? So I'm, I'm not entirely sure that I'm understanding the question, but if, if, if the thing that comes before Mac.com or me.com is the same, then there's no problem. Uh, Apple, for the purposes of I, the iTunes store, Apple will treat those as completely interchangeable. Um, if, if you're talking about two different usernames, like different stuff before Mac.com, like one thing before Mac.com and a different thing before me.com, then yes, Apple will treat those as, as different and independent. Okay, and let's see. Um, one more comment. Um, this is, as I were sort of slightly out of order here, but uh, um, Suman Chakrabadi says uh, he misses your ponytail. And, uh, but Thank meanwhile, you. back at Mobile Me Gallery, can one of the web tools you mentioned quickly import all your galleries? Um, and that would be a quick way to back up and then at one convenience, at one's convenience, upload to a host. Uh, I don't know. I am not. I, I have not heard, as far as I can recall, of any web-based, you know, photo sharing service that that says, you know, here's a one cl one click import of your mobile me galleries. Um, I'm not saying that such a thing doesn't exist, but I I don't know of any. Zang um, Zang does some of that. Does it? Okay. I, I can't remember whether it's one click, but it's pretty close to one click. Okay. Cool. So. Um, okay, I think we've got a couple more questions, but they're, they're sort of bouncing around between sections, so why don't we continue on with the slides, okay, and good. we can pick up some more questions at the end. All right, so what if you have some, you, you've, you've migrated to iCloud on a device, a couple of devices, but you have some devices that can't use iCloud, what then? Well, again, um, migrate whichever ones you can now, now, this, today, this afternoon, don't delay, uh, but do it in a relaxed fashion. Um, as for the other devices, uh, I'm going to talk first about what if you have a Mac running Snow Leopard, and then what if you have an older iOS device. So first to the Snow Leopard. Now, um, when because Snow Leopard does not inherently support iCloud, we have to sort of break it down into individual services. Um, now, for all those things we mentioned earlier, you know, all the iDisk related stuff, you're on your own, you're going to have to find a different provider. Uh, but let's focus on the stuff that's like online data, like mail contacts calendars. So for email, it's not a big problem. Please go read this article, tidbits.com slash article slash 13,002. Uh, so um, basically, uh, at worst, you might have to change your email account settings a little bit. But basically, iCloud email is just IMAP, and sa same as mobile me. So even if, if, you know, if the server, if we're, if we're all lucky and the servers just redirect behind the scenes, then no harm done. Uh, if not, then you just enter a different email address for your IMAP server and your SMTP server, and you're pretty good to go. So you can still access your email in mail or whatever email client you want to use on Snow Leopard. Now, for calendar, um, iCal is not going to be very happy about talking to iCloud on Snow Leopard. So you have two options. One is to use BusyCal. Now, let me just come out and say BusyCal is way better than iCal in every way, period. Um, the only way it's not better is you have to pay for it, but it's not expensive, and really, just use BusyCal. Um, BusyCal uh, runs on Snow Leopard, it runs on Lion, it runs on Mountain Lion, and it connects to iCloud, and it connects to Google, and it connects to everything else and it just works. It's a really great calendar program. It's one I use, use BusyCal. This announcement paid for, but no. Um, but if you really have to use iCal, if you're really dead set against buying BusyCal, there is a somewhat con you know, convoluted method you can use to get I iCal on Snow Leopard to talk to your I <laughs> iCloud account. And that is mentioned in this uh, second article on Tidbits that Adam wrote, Go there and uh, absorb the complete dis uh, instructions. For contacts, the only, so a address book on Snow Leopard talking to iCloud, that's out. That's not going to happen. So, sorry. Um, the only third party tool I know of offhand that will let you connect to your iCloud contacts and show them and view them and edit them 
on a Snow Leopard Mac is called Soho Organizer. Now, Soho Organizer does other things too, you know, calendars and whatnot, but it's the contacts we're particularly interested in here. Adam uh, will be writing an article about this in tidbits real soon. <laughs> um, but, uh, but basically, uh, ditch address book, just stop using address book. Don't worry about it. You, you'll have the same addresses, the same data, um, the data from iCloud, but use Soho Organizer instead. And then you can still use addresses, or sorry, contacts on your iOS device to get at your um, iCloud contacts. Now, for everything else, uh, yeah, sorry. Um, what can I say? You know, like there there, there are third-party bookmark syncing tools like uh, Xmarks, um, but they're not really gonna they're not gonna do exactly the same thing. Like they're not gonna s synchronize with Safari on your iOS device, they sync with something else. Um, and all those other things like, you know, find my Mac and back to my Mac and all those other uh, neat services, uh, that you're just not going to get them to work on Snow Leopard, so sorry. Um, now what about older iOS devices? Well, um, there's some good news. So <clears throat> again, mail, exactly the same story as on Snow Leopard, you should be okay. Uh, the most you'll have to do is change a few settings. Um, everything else, though, you're going to have to look for a third-party solution because, again, um, contacts and calendar on iOS 4 are not going to connect to iCloud. But the good news is that, sorry, I'm, I, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Hold, hold that thought. There's good news coming in just a second. But the solution to that coming after the next slide. Um, if you have no devices that can move to iCloud at all, all of your devices are older, you know, Snow Leopard are older on your Macs, older iOS devices, please, at the very least, if you do nothing else, go to www.me.com slash move and migrate just your email account. This is now an option. This appeared a month and a half ago or so, um, and you can migrate just your email account, and then afterwards, later on, when you have another compatible device, you can migrate the rest of your stuff. Then, um, and yeah, addressed already. Um, for calendars, I, I want to mention that iCal and Snow Leopard and calendars in iOS 4 both support CalDAV and Exchange 2007. So if you are looking for a different way, you know, your, your goal is to sync calendars amongst different devices with the cloud and with your older iPhone and with Snow Leopard Mac and whatever, and you can't use iCloud because it's not compatible with all your devices, basically find any service that either supports CalDAV or supports Exchange 2007, sign up with that, and you will get calendar syncing. And the same story for contacts. If you have uh, a third-party service that supports the CardDAV format uh, protocol or an Exchange 2007 server, then you can connect to that with address book on your uh, older Mac or with contacts on your iOS device. For example, Google, Gmail and Gmail contacts and Google Calendar um, all work with both older Macs and newer Macs and both older iOS devices and newer iOS devices. So if you're, if you're, if iCloud just isn't going to do it for you, um, you can get access to most of, most of the same services that, that iCloud offers through Google and they're free. Um, if you prefer Exchange, um, you can actually connect to your Google account using Exchange protocols, Google it. Um, but uh, if you prefer an actual Exchange server, like a Microsoft Exchange server that is hosted by another company and your employer doesn't have one, there are a bunch of commercial services that let individuals sign up for Exchange accounts. Uh, one I use is called MailToWeb.com. You sign up, you pay them a little bit of money uh, per month, and you get a, a single full Exchange account, which is not only email, but contacts and calendars and notes and all the other stuff that's part of Exchange, and that syncs really uh, wonderfully with your iOS device and your Snow Leopard Mac. Uh, there's also a service called, uh, I'm, I'm going to say Fruks. They, they, they need to have a pronunciation guide on their site. I don't know. But uh, again, this is, a, this is contact and calendar and uh, task syncing um, that uh, uses CardDAV and CalDAV. Um, so it, it's, it's those standards. It's not, um, it's not uh, Exchange. But if you want an alternative to Google, um, sign up for this. It's free at the moment, you know, freemium plans coming in the future and so forth. But uh, this is another uh, good option. 
Now, um, I, I realize we have gone a little bit longer than we anticipated, but that's because we took these, uh, these breaks to answer questions. Um, I do want to, I, I, would, I would not want to end my presentation without trying to sell you something. So um, if you want to learn more about not just getting into uh, iCloud, but like all the actual, how, how do I use mail? How do I set up aliases? How do I sync my, you know, share my calendars and sync my contacts and do all those other sorts of things? Um, please buy Take Control of iCloud. It uh, has tons of material in it. It's 157 pages long. It's 15 bucks. And um, I have already started working on a new edition that will cover all the new stuff in iCloud that's coming in Mountain Lion. Mountain Lion will be released next month. And as soon as humanly possible after Mountain Lion is released, we'll have a new edition of this book out that will cover all those new features as well. And uh, our, our normal policy is that when we have a new edition or new version of the book, it's not a full edition, just a new version, um, people who have bought it recently will get it for free. So you don't have to worry about that purchase. Buy it now. Uh, in another month, you'll get the Mountain Lion version, and you'll learn all about the new stuff in iCloud. So with that, I would like to ask if there are any general questions or final questions or things I did not touch on at all that uh, you're really wondering about um, other than my hair. And uh, I, will, I will tell you what I can. All right, Jeff, thanks. That was great. Uh, anyone need to take a break, remember that you can pause the presentation and come back where you left off to sort of like TiVo. Um, we do have a couple more questions here, and I imagine we'll be getting a few more rolling in. Um, C.D. Bruce asks on Twitter, any comments about MobileMe Family Pack members? What happens with them? Yeah, um, I, I talk about that in the book. Um, basically, um, each, each family member is going to turn into an independent iCloud account. So there is no such thing as an iCloud Family Pack. There doesn't need to be because it's free. Um, so everybody, uh, basically, each family member should take their individual um, username and password and separately migrate their account to iCloud. They will all get separate iCloud accounts, and that's the short version of the story. Okay. Avery Herman asked, um, it's regarding photo gallery, and Avery has an iWeb site hosted on GoDaddy and is using the slideshow feature in iWeb for several extensive slideshows. Not, not yeah. iPhoto, but the slideshow is sort of one of those widgets that's built into, right, right, right. Um, built in. Are there any alternatives to keep slideshows working until I rebuild the site outside of iWeb? Well, the, if the site is hosted on GoDaddy right now, then you're is fine. It, yeah, doesn't iWeb have some kind of a feature to do that as a as kind of a proprietary widget, though? Yeah, it's like it's JavaScript or something. It's it's part of it's part you know J iWeb built you know cooks this into your web page. So that capability isn't coming from Mobile Me. That that is that is built into the the web page. Okay. So you you are already experiencing the fact that it continues to work um, outside of of Mobile Me now. That, that probably isn't your actual question. You're probably, you're, what you're probably wondering is, when the day comes when I decide I can't continue using iWeb, I really want to use something that's going to be maintained and supported, um, is there, do any of these other tools have a built-in way of converting iWeb's slideshow to something that they intrinsically support? And the answer to that is, <laughs> I know. Um, I, you know, that, again, that's something I, I, I've never used that feature in iWeb, so I it never really, I never really investigated it. Um, I honestly, I would be a little bit surprised if, if any of the competing products had that built in, but I've been surprised before. Um, take a look at Sandbox. Take a look at Rapid Weaver. They, they might have something like that. Okay. Um. Uh, I think this is mostly just confirmation. Eolex Dobblehos asked, on my Mac, due to legacy software, I'm not yet ready for Lion, and I also haven't used MobileMe much. You say start with the Mac, so I guess I should wait until I use, to use iCloud until I have a Mac with Lion. But, <laughs> but I imagine it's one of those things where presumably he's got to start changing things over soon. So here are your choices. Um, you can go to your friendly neighborhood Apple store and get a new Retina MacBook Pro, or whatever, <laughs> you, you can get a Mac that has Lion. Uh, if you have a Mac that is able to be upgraded to Lion, you can upgrade it. You can go to a friend's house, say, can I, can I borrow your Mac? Can I log out of your iCloud account and log in as, as, as me under mobile me, 
just for the purpose of making this transition, then I will log back out as me and log back in as you. Or you can go to that me.com slash move page and just transition your email now because you don't need a Lion Mac to do that. You can do that on anything. And then later on, once you have a Mac that's running Lion or some other compatible system, you can, you can use that to migrate the rest of your stuff. So those are, those are some options for you. Okay. Uh, Jody Hudson asks, how can I sync keychains? And, uh, and, and I, I don't know whether you have an answer to that, but um, interestingly, Thomas Templeman uh, noted in Twitter earlier on, you should mention Keychain to Go, which syncs keychains even to iOS. So have you seen Keychains to Go? This is news to me. I am <laughs> writing it down. One of the things that we run into with sometimes, oh, my, my video is frozen here. One of the things we run into sometimes is that, particularly in the iOS world, stuff is just changing so fast, and there is so much that's going on. That there's literally no humanly way to keep, keep up with it. And so we really appreciate when people tell us about these things they've discovered, like Keychain to Go. So yeah, we'll, we'll, um, and we'll put something more Keychain to Go in the comments here, and, uh, and so we'll get a URL for people who can't find that. Okay, um, this is actually a kind of an administrative question. Um, Marcel uh, Vachon asks, can we get a copy of the slides? Obviously, we've got the video that will be available afterwards, um, but uh, do you mind putting up the, the slide deck too, Joe? Maybe perhaps uh, as a keynote presentation or as a PDF? Uh, I don't <laughs> mind. Um, I, I think my provisional answer to that is that the best way to consume this is in video format. Um, we'll, we'll have to talk about that offline. Okay. So we'll see, but certainly the, the, uh, you know, the presentation obviously will be available afterwards. Okay, Patrick McClure asks, is there any danger that iTunes Match or Photo Stream will jam up a mobile device if your main computer has lots of data? <clears throat> the world is a dangerous place. <laughs> um, I, I, I can never promise you will be completely free of danger. Um, you know, I have I have heard my my experience with with PhotoStream and iTunes Match has has been very good. I have I found them to be uh, pretty reliable and do what they are advertised as doing. I have read stories of people who have had difficulties of one sort or another. I I feel sorry for those uh, experiences. I I don't work for Apple. I don't have any inside information. So um, all, all I can say is that should work. In my experience, it works. can't give you a guarantee. Um, I don't know what Apple's parameters are, you know, at how, you know what, what quantity of data does a given machine or a given uh, system bog down. Um, so I, I just don't have a good answer for that, I'm afraid. Okay. Um, Debbie Cherry asks on Twitter, um, I wonder if she's actually asking quite what she thinks she's asking, is it still possible to use a I've got a shortened URL. I'm guessing a mobile me account, a me.com account for iChat under Leopard. Um, and I'm not quite sure what that means, to be honest. Well, so, <coughs> um, every, every somebody at Mac.com address and somebody at me.com address is automatically an AIM username. So th those two systems are tied together. So um, you, you can absolutely sign into iChat on Leopard with uh, any Mac.com or Me.com username. Okay. And then uh, finally, Mark Williamson has a couple of uh, kind of uh, expansions on things which are very helpful. Is one noticing, noting that iCloud accounts, although they are free, um, if you want extra storage, then you'll have to pay. So if you right. had uh, a significant amount of storage that you were paying for on MobileMe, then you might end up doing the same thing on iCloud, and then it wouldn't be free, just something to keep Yeah, it, it, it's possible. The thing about that, though, is that iCloud doesn't have any independent storage. It doesn't have, you know, there's nothing like iDisk. So it's actually kind of complicated to figure out how much data am I storing there and what's, what's using it. Now, one of the slides I showed um, showed a screen on your, your iPhone where you can get exactly that data, and there's also a place in the iCloud preference panel on your Mac where you can get that data. But um, basically, the data that's being stored is backups of your stuff and um, documents in the cloud. So anything like, you know, iWork apps or uh, other, you know, 
uh, third-party apps that use documents in the cloud, their data is, is what gets stored up in there. And, and so you probably, I mean, we'll see what happens in the future, but right now it looks like um, it's, it's pretty hard to find apps that can even generate enough data to, to get close to that, that free limit. So um, uh, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be too worried about that yet. Okay, and, and finally, uh, Mark Williamson also notes that uh, one password can be a sort of replacement for uh, syncing of keychain kind of data uh, for people once you're, you're in the iCloud world. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I, I use one password. I love it. Um, I use it on all my devices. Um, unfortunately, there are, there are certain kinds of things that you can store in a keychain that, that just are outside of the realm of what one password can touch. One, one password is great for things that, that happen in a web browser. Um, but system level things like, you know, um, AFP servers that you log into or, and, and things of that sort um, just are outside of, of what uh, 1Password can deal with. So it's, it's, it's good. It's great. I, I recommend it, but it's not a 100% uh, replacement for keychain. And Kevin Johnson also, again, extending things, saying that Flickr, despite its native support with an iPhoto and Aperture, doesn't offer anywhere near the attractive or customizable layouts you can find in SmugMug or Zenfolio. Right. Um, but two other services that he, for photo sharing to consider that he mentioned he's liked uh, are uh, dphoto.com for the casual user and photoshelter.com for professionals. So I'm not, so not familiar with either of those, but thank you very much for those recommendations. It is it you know something that I mean Joe said before and is absolutely the case is that this stuff just there's just vast amounts out there and in, you know we can only tell you what we know about and so again you know hearing the things the services that you've had good good success with so okay I think that's pretty much everything um, well, thank you everyone uh, for your kind attention this was uh, this was a, a great great you know first time doing this uh, doing this sort of event so thank you very much yes thanks again Joe and thanks to everyone for joining us for this first tidbits presents Please do let us know what you think of this presentation in the Google Plus comments, in the YouTube comments, once the video is available there. And we'll, of course, be publishing a Tibbets article about this with the video embedded in it. So uh, let us know in the comments. We really want to hear from you. Um, and particularly, if you had trouble with the video, I'd like to hear about that because, you know, we can only report stuff to Google if we know what's going on and uh, we can't tell what you're seeing as well as you can. So. Thank you very much. I'm going to end the broadcast now, so until next time.